Thank you very much and uh, thank you uh, Santosh for this uh, Aishala which uh, obviously is a roaring success and I'll be talking about something which is uh, on career options uh, before a young ophthalmologist uh, is there. Uh, okay, the first important thing which uh, is not there uh, in this slide is that it is never too late to change. Uh, and if you have got into ophthalmology by default, or if you don't love ophthalmology, I think it uh, there are enough and more options that are available in today's world that you can leave ophthalmology and do something else. So I'm not going to delve into that particular thing, but let me see that in case you are, uh, you are an ophthalmologist and you have finished your residency, then what do you exactly, uh, uh, what are the options that are there for an ophthalmologist who wants to pursue ophthalmology as a career and who has passion for ophthalmology? So as soon as you get the results for your exams, uh, whether it be the MS, MD or the diploma or you have the DNB, etc., there would be an initial sense of euphoria that you have. But then over time, you really set out to think as to what on the crossroads is available to you. You might feel a sense of loss, but I, what I will strongly suggest is all of you uh, should look for somebody as a mentor. And a mentor mentee relationship is something very important. Somebody who has spent more time in that particular uh, domain, he knows or she knows, and they would be able to tell you more as to what you want to do. Now, the first and the foremost thing that you have, you might have passed an exam, the kind of skill sets that are required to pass an exam, maybe something different from the skill sets that you need to uh, kind of become successful. So the first and the only important way for you to decide as to what it is to sit down, relax and do a self-assessment as to what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. You have to, uh, you have to uh, hone your skills. You have to actually take care of all your weaknesses and develop your strengths so that you are able to be successful. Now, as regards this, uh, the self-assessment, what, what is very, very important is that you need to know whether you had the in-depth basic knowledge of ophthalmology and you may not be able to diagnose certain, like for example, if there is a tumor or something, I would say I can refer to Santosh or somebody, but if I have to look at ophthalmology, if 100 patients are coming into the OPD clinic, how many of them I can diagnose and what percentage so because majority of them are common uh, uh, clinical entities. So how many of them you can diagnose the next step after the clinical basics is how confident are you of your surgical skills, whether you are aware of all the basic diagnostic techniques and whether you are aware of all the uh, all the surgical techniques which could handle say 90% or 80% of the patients that are going to come to your uh, center or your clinic, this is there. And how do you know, how much do you know about the latest advancement in technology? Because technology over time has taken a strong place and will keep on increasing the place uh, in your practice that is there. Now, if you are dividing yourself in the self-assessment, if you are confident of what you have learned in that particular uh, space, the, that uh, the three years or more that you have spent, then you are fine. But in case you feel that you are not confident clinically, then you have to opt for a comprehensive fellowship from a reputed institute uh, where you can see uh, different types of patients and you can have people who are really skilled in their field to be guiding you or telling you as to what it is. The second thing, similarly, the self-assessment that you have to do is that are you confident of your surgical techniques. What are your outcomes? Have you maintained a logbook in your junior residency? Uh, I did say 100 cataracts or 150 cataracts. What was the outcome? What were the complication rates? What were the uh, visual outcomes, etc.? And compare it with the documented rates that are there uh, across the globe or across the world. If you are in this category of no, then you have to enroll yourself in a surgical training program that is there. Now, the next important thing after you have gained or known the skills, uh, whether you do a fellowship or a senior residency or whatever you want to do, 
you would then want to actually look at your future plans as to what are your future plans would you want to do a ophthalmology practice as a general practitioner would you wish to do super specialty training would you wish to do research work and i think this is a dire need uh, where you can actually excel where the competition is not too great just now and do you have inclination towards academic work so these are the important things that you have to decide as to what it is now let's come to the first one that is the practice option so one is a solo practice that uh, again has its uh, advantages and disadvantages the only advantage that you have is that you are uh, you are your own lord and master of yourself but i think adjustment mutualism having a collaborative approach is going to be the future and when you are looking at the practice options that you have it could either be uh, this is uh, like i'm saying it could be a corporate practice it could be an institutional practice or one more thing that you can write is a group practice uh, but getting a group created is the most difficult thing creating is one part of it but sustaining it and if there is a divorce having a, a a bloodless divorce as i would say that would be something which is very very important and solo practice is obviously one of the routes that you have so these are the four kind of things that you can look at solo practice group practice corporate practice and institutional practice and finally there would be the government job i would say that the government job uh, there are limited institutions which are great a uh, majority of the time if you want a cushy life or at times people do their own practice in a government job that could be something which i am not made of that kind of a situation where uh, i uh, if you don't get uh, a kind of uh, good outcomes or good equipment is available to you for a government job and finally you can have the ngo space where there is enough and more you have the site savers you have uh, help page and those kind of things you can go in for an ngo that is there now when you look at a solo practice what i told you the biggest advantage is you are uh, you are your own master but that is in itself a rate limiting step or a biggest disadvantage that you are on your own uh, you cannot master all the aspects there is a limit to where you can be known as uh, the last word in particular thing that means that supposing uh, uh, today we looking at oncology uh, in india or in this area the last word would possibly be dr santosh if you look at uh, retina maybe dr natarajan would be for vr surgeries etc so you can only be a master of a limited field because the field is so well expanded that is there and you have to be dependent for specialized service to the other people so that is the biggest problem that you have in a solo practice and you cannot keep updated with the latest technology very few solo practitioners have been have the ability to keep on reinvesting uh into the latest technology and also you have a problem of financial and management issues which consume a lot of time and energy i would say there is a lot of brain damage that happens when you go into these financial and these uh management issues as a solo practitioner which is there uh the second thing is for you to go on into a group practice where multiple specialists uh, specialties can be covered and the uh, the infrastructure cost as also the equipment cost the finances get shared which is there uh between the group practice and it is the important thing is that it is challenging to find and associate with like minded professor uh, professionals it is easier said than done that we can go into a group practice so as i said getting into a group retaining that group maintaining that group and if god forbid you are not able to continue how do you get uh, separated so that is the problem that if the differences crop up what do you do now the third thing uh, that apart from solo and from the uh, group prac uh, from the group practice third could be a corporate practice now obviously in a corporate setup uh, it is going to be different from say a government setup where at times mediocrity would be the rule but in a corporate setup i would say that talent is of value so so there are there can be uh, there can be differential uh, uh, so in a government job or if you are looking at that if an if a person is an associate professor b person is a asset uh, or you are a specialist all the specialists would be in the same rank except for the 1000 2000 rupees increment because of seniority do you that you get but in a corporate practice uh you could be uh, drawing two times or three times uh, the salary of another person provided you are providing that value uh, to that corporation as regards your skill sets your uh, your uh, uh, your prominence in that field and the patient following that is there the other important thing that is there is that you would have the opportunity to work with the best of the trade people 
uh, uh, you can see the success story uh, of several corporations. Uh, IR is the biggest success story in ophthalmology that controls 10% of the ophthalmic practice of China. And they have grown successfully and it has provided a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for people to work with the latest technologies. They purchased about 100 Visumax or uh, 45 or 100 Visumax uh, machines uh, to be put across the uh, the entire uh, IR chain and now they have expanded to Europe and they've expanded to US. So corporations are going to come in because ultimately technology needs money to buy technology. The growth potential is obviously there. You can buy, uh, you can enter a corporate, they can give you a center to manage or uh, you can uh, uh, do things and there is the upgradation of the clinical skills which happens. Now the next thing after the corporate, as I told you, is to get an institutional at, uh, attachment and that is if you are academically inclined, uh, you are good for research and publication work. You can be involved in various training programs and studies and you can get into institutions like AIMS or uh, LVP or uh, uh, maybe Shankar Netrale, etc. So those, those are the institutional setups that you can have. Now, the next thing that I told you was the government job where merit is usually not the thing. Once you get in after that, uh, there are promotions that happen with time scale, etc. It may not be very conducive to, uh, to achieving excellence. There are few bright spots in the government service which are still there. But I think uh, these are far and few uh, uh, that you have these bright spots. Technology acquisition is the biggest drawback at times. The HOD may not be having these skill sets at the time. At uh, times, uh, uh, these were stories and these are things when we were residents, even a slit lamp, uh, uh, the oculus would be taken out by the HOD in some medical college and not a uh, resident cannot even use the slit lamp. So that could be a problem that you have. So if you are in government job, it can be transferable. You can be in one particular state and you can be transferred within the state, etc. That is there. And obviously, as things stand today, there could be political, social uh, pressure, etc. That is there. NGOs today uh, still in India have space, but there are couple of NGOs that are able to raise funds. The biggest thing is that there may be NGOs which may or may not be able to raise funds, but then you have to have the outreach programs. You have to be uh, having a sense of going out in the community because there are a lot many people who are underserved whom you might want to bring to the base camp uh, approach that is there. Uh, it may not be the best approach for a growth potential and there may be a lack of access to new technology that is there. So I think uh, these are the various options that you have uh, when you uh, uh, step out. But self-assessment is something which is very, very important. Knowing where you are, what you stand, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses is very, very important. And after that, what is most important is uh, you have to ask yourself what you are doing today. Is it getting you closer to where you want to be tomorrow? So uh, I would say that once you are stepping into something, just have a long-term plan and the long-term plan blueprint maybe for a decade or two decades uh, where you want to think minimal it has to be for five years that you need to think if i am doing this particular thing what do i want to achieve where i want to be what is it that is going to give me satisfaction in life and this is my professional uh, requirement for me uh, to get for being a satisfied professional and accordingly, you have to choose your career paths. I think uh, in today's world, the career paths are increasing over time. There are enough good uh, uh, locations, institution, corporations uh, that are there. If you have to go into a solo practice, please choose a place where there isn't oversaturation of ophthalmologists because that is going to be uh, the tough uh, thing to crack uh, because the barrier to entry has actually gone up with a lot of technology and equipment that is uh, available today and you have to spend few crores to be able to set up a practice worth uh, something to be counted uh, in the scenario of practitioners in that particular area. So uh, friends, uh, uh, happy to talk to any one of you over uh, time. You want to ask any questions, I'll be happy to answer. But uh, uh, there is the passion that you need to have to be successful. And for that, you need to have the career options very well defined as to what you want to do. And I would say it isn't out of place to have an exposure overseas because that broadens your uh, expertise. Uh, you can go there for three months, observer six, six months, one year, but that is going to broaden your, uh, your horizon of thought as to what all you can think, you can, you can start thinking big and dreaming big and uh, uh, achieve a lot more success in your life. 
than if you were within a cocoon or within a kind of a small sheltered environment that you have been throughout your life. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Santosh. Any questions, any of the panelists? Till. Haru. I uh, I just make a comment here, uh, Santosh. Is it okay? Or... Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So any uh, thank uh, thank you, Santosh, for having me here. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Mahipal's presentation was uh, very crisp and uh, very to the point. But the last slide uh, is was quite impressive. But I just want to add up on something in that uh, that, that contents is you know how far are you from your goalpost, your eventual goal? I think you should have plan A, plan B, plan C. You know it is not always uh, that you know you, you you succeed in achieving plan A. Then you need to think about plan B. So sometimes you do have a goalpost and you assess yourself, you see the reality, see where life is taking you. You know then you can always you know go to plan B. And once you go to plan B wholehearted, you know, I mean, it is, you'll realize that, you know, it was a decision which perhaps was better than you pursuing plan A. Now, there have been a lot of people who have worked in private practice, you know, now they have joined institutes and the reverse flow also has occurred. Corporate sector, highly successful practitioners, they have started off solo on their own and they're doing extremely well. But I think, you know, you have to personally customize it and you have to find out where you fit in and then, you know, keep changing your, uh, you know, your, uh, the, the process, maybe a goalpost, and uh, ultimately, you know, you find you will meet with success. Yeah, Rup, I would 100% uh, agree with you. I just gave, gave a talk in the LDP, and the last slide there was adaptability. So <laughs> that is uh, what you are saying that uh, you need to actually be able to adapt uh, and uh, uh, change because change is the only constant, and I need the fastest adapter is going to be uh, somebody who is going to be successful because the scenario is going is changing very fast uh, and the speed of change is going to be faster you we when we were kids or when we were youngsters we had never heard of something like an e-commerce or something like that and you can see that suddenly there is so much of uh, this thing on digitization artificial intelligence on change so you need to adapt and keep on learning uh, uh, that is something as you go along and uh, uh, that is uh, going to be a cornerstone for success being adaptive. Well, can I say something? I think uh, plan B should be there for some things, but for some things, there should be no plan B. Because if you have a plan B, then you don't work for a plan A and you know that there's an alternative there. Of course, uh, there should be, there should be, smile. Santosh is already smiling. But uh, I, I feel for some things which, you know, you are very passionate about and for some things that you really want to do, there should be no plan because that weakens your you know thought process but i'm sure sir that has happened with you also there was never a plan b that you want to leave rp center what will you do there was a never a plan b that you will make center for site institute you know of research and uh, sub specialities etc so i think for your main goal you it's difficult to have a plan b for what you want but in between to maybe reach that goal you can you know divert your literary no, i think yeah you're right one has to be alert you know keep on getting the feedback self feedback and you know sometimes i have noticed in some situations plan c has worked out much better than what plan a would have worked out for a particular individual so i think yeah, being I flexible think so. and you know being uh, open to change what, as dr maypal mentioned what you are saying is absolutely correct and what dr namrata is saying is also correct because if you have the ropes and the strings attached i still remember when i was to leave rp center at that particular time, I was told by people and there was an offer for uh, some senior uh, ophthalmologist that you come and start doing FACOs for us. Uh, I said, no boss, if I Adi Pony in Hindi, you say Adha Pona, so, usse kuch nahi hoga. so basically you have to cut your ropes and then go wholehearted. Like if you have to learn swimming, they say just push the uh, child in a swimming pool and he will uh, learn. So I agree with that that you need to cut your ropes uh, at times to be able to be successful because that's when you're going to put in your 110%. But adaptability, plan A, plan B, yes, uh, that is also very, very uh, correct. And plan C also, but we don't plan. That is the main thing. The point is to put a blueprint and a plan as to what you want to do over the next 5, 10, 15 years. That is the most important thing. Plan B 
is the second stage but having a plan is what we don't do we need to as a youngster plan uh, our future yes she uh, everybody is not my equal and if you throw every potential swimmer into a swimming pool he may die also see <laughs> uh, therefore therefore you know your limitations sir is it and all by first life <laughs> no no what i'm saying is there are a lot of youngsters who keep asking me on a on a uh, you know uh, they are confused whether to you know pursue this aspect uh, you know government job private job or this thing this thing guidance is there some people are very clear that like maipal was clear as soon as he finished his uh, you know concert lecture up and he said mere ko practice karna hi so therefore i started by saying everybody is not maipal everybody may not be able to decision everybody may not be have that backing everybody may not be have so be so lucky to have all the technology at hand so that that is the situation where you know youngsters are standing on a on a confused state whether to do this or that that is very very important what what one maipal would you advise them you know i told you that i don't know whether you joined on time i said that the thing to do a self assessment ye karna kya hai what you want to do that is the most important thing you need to you see in india a failure is looked down upon yeah. in you in you are in us being an entrepreneur means the failed once fails twice fails thrice and third time successful like uh, arup was saying that is given uh, the person a plus plus marks that he is a trier so what i am just trying to say is in the service industry or in the practice your academic knowledge and your surgical skill have to be honed to an extent that you can make a difference and you can be a shade above what the rest of the people can do so uh, you have to clarify yourself at that particular time i want to be a retina specialist i want to be today is the age of super specialization if you want to be a general ophthalmologist go to a tier 3 city so you need to uh, within yourself think as to what is going to give me the comfort and what is going to be my satisfaction great that is what you have to do and ultimately i have shared all the six seven options that are available for a person to uh, go ahead and do that uska bent of mind ka hai that is the most important thing like you remember writing papers was our uh, uh, i would say uh, that is what we uh, loved doing at that particular time uh, you uh, were yes oh, yeah, i remember you know epidemic dropsy we wrote seven eight papers out of that yeah and santosh wrote about the diagnostic test for uh, cornea i remember <laughs> <laughs> that was my first paper that was his first and, paper. and solar eclipse retinopathy dr lalit sir would you uh, yeah. remember <laughs> i have a solar eclipse cell in our <laughs> solar eclipse <laughs> retinopathy uh, due to all respect to the doctors uh, if you don't mind can we just move on to the next speaker i request the chairperson to please call upon the next speaker over to the chairperson please and dr namrata the maximum nine, the number of citations that are coming now is on silver sulfide i know, I know. <laughs> but if i go research gate say every day that comes there is silver sulfide is being quoted today for antifungals i don't know <laughs> certainly come back into <laughs>